At this point, though, it is my honor and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Derek Carr. He is another core engineer to the a key Kubernetes contributor within the Red Hat engineering team, and he's going to walk us through some amazingly interesting content in the form of what does it mean to be a pod? We're going to drill down into that pod, and we're actually going to visit the pod universe and across the cosmos. So at this point, let's turn it over to Derek. Derek, over to you. Thanks, Bert. Uh, let me share my screen. And hopefully this is coming through. Yep, so uh, what I wanted to do today was dive in a little bit uh, deep into how pods actually work, right? We see a lot of uh, innovation in the developer community wanting to run their apps. And uh, as enterprises look to adopt OpenShift and Kubernetes, sometimes uh, there's some challenges in trying to figure out how to get it through your security team, understanding the flow that uh, the platform's actually providing to support running your apps securely at production. So in today's demonstration, I kind of want to do a very deep dive on basically all the network connections, uh, the individual components that are used to actually bring up uh, your pod. A little bit about myself, uh, similar to Clayton and Jessica, I've been working on OpenShift for a very long time. Uh, active in the upstream Kubernetes community, presently uh, privileged to serve as a steering committee member, and I help co-chair uh, both the architecture and node SIGs. And in the past, uh, I ran a resource management working group that helped drive uh, some little features around things like GPUs and huge pages and stuff like that to allow people to build more um, exciting workloads to run on the platform. Uh, at Red Hat, I'm a distinct engineer who uh, as a member of our uh, OpenShift architecture team. So excited to talk through uh, pods and Kubernetes today. So, you know, typically things start with the app, right? Uh, the developer has an idea, they put some energy out and write up a little container and they want to deploy it. Um, the next question typically is, well, where do I run this thing? And, you know, at Red Hat, we're a big believer in the hybrid cloud. But at the day, end of the day, when you choose to run in a hybrid cloud, you need an operations team, right? So you you have to pair that developer with your operations team to provide a place to run your app. And because we're here talking about OpenShift today, we're gonna assume that your operations team has created a cluster for you in some region of the hybrid cloud galaxy. And we're gonna name that cluster uh, home for your application. And everyone dreams that their applications are gonna be super popular. Uh, and as a result, you need a lot of ingress uh, to drive traffic into your cluster so the world can access it. Um, and within that Kubernetes cluster, that ingress is connecting to services that ultimately know how to route traffic from the outside world uh, into your nodes and into your pods. And so your nodes end up looking like this, but as an end user, you can't see that. And at the end of the day, those nodes are just executing a bunch of pods. And we like to think of pods as these compartmentalized, uh, self-contained units. And we depend on things like the kubelet and the Linux host to provide the right primitives to isolate one application from another so you can drive density and uh, improve end user performance for your workloads. But a lot of times uh, that's where discussion ends and we just kind of take it for granted that the system works. Um, but when working with your operations team, it's often important for them to actually understand uh, the guarantees and the security boundaries that come with uh, running pods on the platform. And so we're gonna take a step back here, Burr, and we're gonna ask how do pods actually work? And so what we're gonna do in today's talk is kind of run through a simple uh, demonstration. A lot of people when they interface with Kubernetes uh, type kube control help, see a kube control run and wanna run a simple pod. In this case, we're gonna run a, a busy box container and get a shell into that container. And we're gonna talk through how that works. So what I'll do here is kube control run. And we'll start my pod. Now, right now I have an OpenShift server uh, cluster deployed in uh, Amazon right now. And assuming everything goes well, I will now have a pod really quickly. And so when I'm in this pod, everybody's used to familiar containerizing demos and you can type things like PS and see that I am the only uh, process running in this pod. And you can type things like DF and you see the file systems that are available to me. And we're depending on the platform to provide the right isolation between the host resources and the resources that are visible to the container. 
And so we like to ask, well, how does that work? And so what I want to do to take a step back here is talk from an end user experience, in this case, that cube control and user client, and talk about what's happened before I got that pod. And so the first key network flow to understand is basically that client to control plane traffic communication. Uh, so a default OpenShift distribution of Kubernetes will put a public load balancer in front of a set of machines that we use to uh, label as running your control plane uh, processes. And that control plane is basically running a key process called the Kube API server. And it's listening on a port uh, serving over TLS, uh, traditionally over 6443. And your client is ultimately connecting to one of those API server instances over that load balancer. And that client is typically connecting by providing a set of authentication credentials. So a CA, a cert, and a key that allow you to identify who that client is and what rights they have against that API server. Um, now there's a lot of configuration knobs that we expose within OpenShift to allow you to configure things like how TLS is uh, secured, how encryption occurs, and basically controlling what type of certs you can deploy in the platform. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, that client uh, is interacting with that API server to declare the state that it wants to have. So in today's demonstration, when I ran that uh, BusyBox container, I said, you know, I want a pod, run it for me, please. I don't care where you run it, but then once it's available, give me a shell into that pod. Now, parallel to uh, the API server, which is what the end user is uh, interacting with, we have a set of worker machines um, that are connecting back to those control plane hosts to figure out what they should do. And so in this case, uh, in a typical OpenShift deployment, you have a set of uh, workers that are running RHEL Core OS, which is our immutable operating system optimized for Kubernetes. And each RHEL Core OS instance is running a kubelet process that is acting as the client to our API server to say, which pods should I run? And that communication between the kubelet and the API server occurs through a different load balancer uh, because it's internal traffic to the cluster. In this case, that's called out as our API internal load balancer. Um, and then that kubelet on that same host is gonna interact with the container runtime. And so basically the relationship between the kubelet and the container runtime are what controls um, ultimately getting your pod uh, executing. And on the right-hand side here, you can see that there's some uh, host resource state that the kubelet is going to set up to uh, manage the isolated view that the pod has uh, from the host. And so there's some state that's going to be stored, which I'll show within varlib kubelet associated with every pod that's running on the literal host file system. And then the kubelet's going to interact with a set of C group controllers that allow you to control the resources that each pod gets. Um, at runtime. And so today in Kubernetes and OpenShift, we support controlling things like access to CPU, um, being able to pin your workload to a particular CPU, how much memory your workload can get. If your workload requires huge pages, uh, we can control access to those large memory pages, as well as provide protection against things like uh, pit exhaustion. Um, the hierarchy that we'll see pods get placed in is important. Every pod is associated with a quality of service criteria based on how it consumes CPU and memory. And based on those uh, knobs that the user requests, you get classified into a guaranteed workload class, a best effort workload class, or a burstable workload class. Um, in today's demonstration, we ran that cube control run uh, for BusyBox. I didn't specify any resources that should be applied to my pod. And so the platform today is just going to be giving me best effort access to resources. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means afterwards. But right here, at a steady state, the kubelet is typically looking at the API server and says, what should I do? What should I do? And right now, we have a node with no pods. Nothing's actually happening. But that's no fun. Um, even when there's a node with no pods, a lot of the patterns within Kubernetes are based around the concept of a controller. And a kubelet is really nothing more than the node local controller. And it's trying to achieve the desired state that the API server says it should have. And so when a node says, I have no pods, the kubelet's going to keep asking the container runtime to verify, are no pods actually running? Now, that communication that occurs between the kubelet and container runtime is over a Unix domain socket. And that's some that's important because when we talk about what can happen when a if it, when or if a container breakout ever occurred, 
Within our OpenShift distribution, we do a lot of things to protect access to the root file system. In particular, we have SC Linux always enabled. And so the actual end user container processes that I'll run here get a different SC Linux label than other pods running on that system that control actually what they can do on that host resource. Um, and that's one of the techniques we use to uh, protect access to uh, the cluster as a whole. So in general, we don't have any pods running right now and the kubelet's just always asking uh, the container runtime, is the state as I desire? And so if you were to pull traffic between the two systems, you'd see a constant interaction about every two seconds, is it as I want it to be? Now, earlier when I went and created that pod to say, I wanna run a busy box container, my client went and sent that pod definition to an API server. And it's important that when you get your workloads onto Kubernetes, uh, that you can control the actual resources your workloads have access to on the hosts that are running them. And with an OpenShift, we have a feature called the security context constraints. Uh, and this allows you to validate what host level resources a pod can access prior to admitting it into your cluster. And by default at Red Hat, we pride ourselves on being secure by default. And so we actually uh, enforce what we call the restricted security context constraint out of the box, which basically denies access to all host features um, and actually will associate your pod to be run with a random UID uh, and SE Linux context that's associated with just your pod's namespace. Um, if your workload required greater privileges, you can go and give yourself greater access to run things like privileged or uh, non-root or host network um, oriented workloads. Uh, but that's the uh, abnormal behavior rather than the norm. Um, so once your pod is accepted into the API server because it's matched a matching security definition, some scheduling magic happens, right? And we're gonna defer that for today's discussion and just assume a node has now been found to run your workload. And so now the kubelet sees your pod, right? It's, it sees I wanna run a busy box container and what should I do? And so let's go take a step back and look at uh, some stuff in action here. So you saw earlier we had this pod running and it was running busy box and I'm inside my container and I can do some actions, but it, what I'll do on the right-hand side here now is open up a separate terminal and try to explore what actually occurred uh, on the node. So I can run kubectl get pods in this namespace. And you'll see my busy box container is running. The API server is telling me it's running. And it's running on a particular node. And so what we're going to do is use a command in the OpenShift OC client to debug that node. And what this is gonna actually do is create a pod with heightened privileges that let me actually understand uh, the host level state of that uh, system and kind of get a backdoor into the cluster. Now, of course, this is an action I can only run if I had heightened privileges and I'm running as a cluster admin here, so that's possible. So I will debug that node. And now a pod is gonna be started on that node. And once it's up and running, I can uh, chroot into the host namespace. Cool. All right, so now I'm basically equivalent of SSHing into that uh, node, but I'm running in a pod boundary. And there are some things that we can do to explore the state of this host. So as I talked about earlier, there's a kubelet running on every machine. And so I can see it's actually running. Uh, and the kubelet's outputting the logs about the state of reaching my desired state. And similarly, there's a container runtime running. And that container runtime in an OpenShift distribution is, is the cryo container runtime. And so cryo is being interacted against uh, with the kubelet and ensuring my containers are running. And so if I wanted to look at the state of the system, a lot of uh, users in the early days of, of containerization in Kubernetes we're very familiar with the uh, uh, Docker CLI. Um, there's been an evolution within Kubernetes to support alternative container runtime choices. And there's a plugin uh, system called the Container Runtime Interface. And now on every Kubernetes node here, there's a debugging tool that lets you interact with your currently configured Container Runtime Interface called CRICTL. And you can do some interactions on that host to see what's available. 
So in this case, what I'll do is I'll run a command that says CRI CTL pods. And I can see there are some pods uh, running on this host. And right here, you can see, okay, there's a, a busy box container running. Um, now, that busy box container earlier when I talked about it uh, is just a normal process, right? There's nothing special about it. And if I use normal tools, I can see where it's running. So in this case, I'll type systemd CGLS. I can look at the actual uh, C group taxonomy on this host to see where my busy box container is. And I said earlier, it's running as a best effort pod. And you can see uh, the kubelet has gone and created a pod level C group to uh, house that container. So how did that actually happen? So the kubelet saw on the API server, hey, uh, you need to be running a pod. And that pod's name is A. And in this case, in our demonstration, it was the, the busy box pod. Now, in uh, the host uh, where the kubelet is running, uh, pods can contain one or more containers, right? And you might have things like init containers or normal containers that can all run concurrently, all bounded by a common pod definition, right? And that common pod definition gives you a common IP address and a common view of say volumes. And so to provide resource isolation across those containers, the kubelet goes and creates a, a bounding C group for all containers in that pod that will control access to things like CPU and memory. And so that when you go in to create your first pod, the kubelet sees it and says, oh, I've got to go create a pod definition uh, for my workload. And you'll see a new slice is created in systemd's uh, taxonomy. Now, the next thing that the kubelet needs to do is get some host resources that might be needed to run your pod projected into your container. And so there are some resources that it will appear in every pod by default. Um, the Etsy host file that's presented to that pod to control access to your DNS configuration, that's actually managed as a file on your home, on your root file system that the Qlet projects in. And then similarly, any volumes that your pod might use to access resources uh, are uh, projected into the container as well. And so if we go and look back at our running host and we look our var libcubit directory, You'll see there's a bunch of uh, subfolders in here. And what we'll do is look under the pods folder. And there's, for every pod running, there's a directory that matches that pod UID. And so we'll just pick one of these. And we'll see what's under here. And what you'll see is uh, the Etsy host file, which actually is nothing more than your DNS configuration that the pod will see, right? How they go and contact particular services in the cluster. And then in addition, uh, we can look at volumes that that pod will have access to. Now, every pod in Kubernetes typically gets mounted with a secret that can then go phone home back to the Kubernetes API server. And so that gets mounted as a volume as well. And on here, you can see the secret directory for that. Um, now, there are many different types of volumes that pods can consume. And so if you're using things like secrets, uh, those volumes are actually stored on a tempfs directory and never actually written to disk. Whereas if you're using things like config maps, they get stored and persisted on that local disk in the directory you saw uh, earlier that we identified here. Um, once all the volumes have attached and mounted uh, and your container still isn't running, uh, you kubelet needs to go fetch the container image to run your container. And oftentimes enterprise clients like to protect their container registry via a secret. And so in this case, if your workload to start uh, to pull the image needs a secret, uh, the kubelet will fetch the pull secret associated with that pod and pass it to the container runtime when doing a container image pool. Now, in this case earlier, I wasn't using a protected uh, container image. But if I was, this is basically the flow here. Uh, the kubelet by default is very controlled on which secrets in the cluster it has access to. So in an OpenShift distribution, the kubelet can only access secrets for pods that are bound to its node um, or secrets that are associated with pods uh, image pool secrets. Uh, but it can't run or fetch arbitrary secrets for any arbitrary node or any arbitrary pod in the cluster. Um, once the uh, image has been pulled, we go and uh, tell the container runtime over the container runtime interface, we want to go and create a sandbox 
And a sandbox is basically telling the container runtime, I, I want you to uh, develop a way to manage a common set of Linux namespaces and an IP address for all the other containers that will be in this pod. Now, if you go and look at a typical uh, OpenShift host, you'll see there's a lot of, for every container, there's something running that's kind of like a pause container. Um, and that pause container is what's holding these common namespaces and IP address. Uh, one of the cool things that's recently just getting merged into Cryo is the ability to eliminate this extra container. Um, and so we'll be using fewer resources per pod on every node. That's pretty cool. Uh, so once the sandbox has been created and uh, you'll see a new uh, item in the secret hierarchy, uh, the container runtime will now be told to pull the image using the secret, if any, uh, that was there earlier. Um, oftentimes in OpenShift, we'll recommend uh, to provide a, an improved security characteristic that the pod spec be uh, classified to always pull uh, the image. Uh, because what happens is the even if the image is always uh, locally cached on your node, when you pass the image pool policy of always, we will re-authenticate that that pod has access uh, to uh, the image. Um, so if you're a security conscious individual and you want to ensure one workload isn't trying to use the image of another workload that it didn't truly really have access to, you want to check out that uh, pool uh, policy option and specify always. Okay, so now we have our container image down and uh, so we have a file system that will define what we want up here in our container, but we still don't really have a, a container yet. And so the Qubit will go in for every container in that pod spec, tell the container runtime, uh, please create a container for my workload. And there's a number of configuration options that the Qubit passes down to the runtime that controls how that container is ultimately containerized. So in this case, uh, it's a lot of things that you might commonly see, like the command you want to run, uh, the environment variables to pass, uh, where logs should be stored, the amount of resources that that container should be given. But then there's some more uh, advanced concepts that many users never have to actually look at that control what capabilities get added and dropped to that container. Uh, what is the privileged rights of that container? Um, what, basically, what access does it have to the resources outside of its container bound? And so if you go back and we look at our pod that we created earlier, we can see some of these things using CRI CTL. So what I'll do is I'll look at our BusyBox pod we created earlier. And then I'll take the ID here. And then there's an inspect pod command. And basically everything that the kubelet is passing down, let me make this a little readable. Everything that the kubelet is passing down uh, to the container runtime about how to containerize that pod is visible here. So um, which namespaces the BusyBox container is able to access. And so you, here as an example, you can see the BusyBox container is able to access for PIDs, only PIDs isolated to its container. Um, whereas this debugging pod I'm running is actually able to access PIDs node-wide. And that's how I'm able to do these debugging actions. Um, and if you scroll down here and you wanted to look at the capabilities that are given to each container, you can inspect these things pretty clearly using CRI CTL. And so you can see which capabilities have been enabled, disabled, things like the mounts that are projected into that container, where the storage is, what its zoom score is, et cetera. And so a lot of times if your container is not operating as you'd like, and you're really getting into the weeds of how to debug what's going on, CRI CTL inspect uh, for your container will provide to be, will, will prove to be an invaluable asset to supporting that. Cool. All right, so the container gets created and you basically get that record uh, in the container runtime that says, how should I be uh, executed? But you're not actually executing yet. And so there's a separate call within the kubelet that says uh, to start your container. And so basically, now that that container manifest is on disk and says how you should run, the kubelet at the end of the day just says, uh, please run me. And only at that point does your process get launched. But it's at this time now properly confined in the right level of the C group hierarchy with the right IPC and Linux namespaces and the right um, isolation primitives that were required by that pod definition. So that's pretty cool. So what happens when you delete a pod? Um, this sometimes is tricking up people. And so I want to talk through this in a little bit of detail. So the kubelet is always watching uh, the API server to say, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And in this case, 
or pod that's running, the end user says, I, I want you to delete this pod. Please delete it now. Uh, and so the kubelet sees that desired state and will start executing what it needs to do to clean up that container uh, resource on the host. And so uh, the kubelet in this case sees the API server uh, desired state for that pod should be removed. And it will start doing what's called graceful termination. And so for every container running uh, on that, uh, associated with that pod, it will go and kill that container and give it a grace period in time. So typically that's 30 seconds, uh, but you can extend it, which basically says how long the container has to shut down before it's forced uh, shut down. And so for each container running in that pod, uh, the kubelet will ask the runtime to kill each of those containers. Once those containers are killed, um, the sandboxing resource that was holding the IP address and uh, the namespaces for all the containers in that pod can now be cleaned up. And so the kubelet will tell the container runtime, okay, I see no more containers are running. Uh, please go and uh, clean up your pod sandbox by stopping it. And so that will basically tell the container runtime to release all those resources. Um, and uh, after that, we now know there's no more processes running that were associated with your pod and the uh, resource has been terminated. Uh, the kubelet will do a little bit of cleanup to clean up those uh, resources under the varlib kubelet pods directory I showed you earlier. And ultimately, uh, the next step here is it will purge that pod C group. So the C group hierarchy has gone back into a pristine state. And only after the kubelet has detected that all the host level resources used by that pod have been uh, purged, will it go and do the final delete back to the API server to delete that pod. And so sometimes end users, when they're debugging Kubernetes or OpenShift, will see pods in a stuck terminating state. And this can sometimes mean that your node is unhealthy that is executing that pod. And the kubelet is unable to guarantee that all the resources have been cleaned up uh, with that uh, pod. And so that final delete does not occur. Uh, this is important for certain workload types. Uh, if you're using things like stateful sets that want to guarantee like sequential ordered shutdown and uh, startup. Uh, but for other workload types like replication controllers and stuff like that where it doesn't care, uh, the control plane may just go and launch uh, new pods to get started. Um, and so earlier in the demonstration, we said, well, how did the exec work? How did I actually get that shell into my container? What's actually happening? So there's a network flow that goes between the control plane and the kubelet uh, that is uh, allowing clients to ultimately get into their container. And so the API server, when it connects to the kubelet, the kubelet's actually running a little serving agent uh, on 10.250. And the API server will go and make a connection to that kubelet uh, and it'll be validated against the serving cert for that kubelet. And then the network flow is basically this. So the kube control client I was running is talking through a load balancer to the API server. The API server then proxies a connection to the kubelet, and then the kubelet proxy connection through the container runtime that says, I want to have an executing shell into there. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have a network flow like you see here that let me get a shell to do uh, the live demonstration we talked through today. Um, logs are pretty similar. And so when you want to look at the logs associated with your pod, there's a similar flow if you type kube control logs where the client is going to the API server, API server is proxying to pod, and then runtime is, is flushing those logs response backs. And so with that, I think I'm probably running on time. And what I will do is pause here. And Burke, can I get a time check? Are we... Um, we are, we are definitely at the moment when we're okay. supposed to be switching at this point. Perfect. And, and so Derek, thank you so much for that. That was actually a, a, a great deep dive presentation for people who are interested in how the Kubelet works, Cryo, Pod, I love all that because people are always asking, how do these pods really work? And I think at the end of the day, people just need to understand they're just processes yep. well managed. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Thank you. So Derek, thank you so much for that. At this point, unfortunately, we do have to bid you adieu as we switch gears and we actually have a technical challenge here on Crowdcast. But thank you so much for that, Derek.